introducing our guest speaker today. I understand she has a Russian connection in Montreal. Is that right, Montreal? Uh, well, you're not a politician, are you? No. Uh, she, has, she has many, many irons in the fire in our community and uh, has exhibited a great deal of talent in, all, in several directions. Linda Holderbaum. Good. Good. Okay, once again, I will say, and you're not out shopping now. I said, what's wrong with you people? Everyone else is out there. But that's good that you are. That's good that you are here. Um, when I was asked to do this talk about a year ago, yes, it was a year ago at least um, that Roberta asked me to do this. And what I wanted to do was, um, I had done research. Well, yes, I had. Obviously, dolls are a big part of my life. And I had done some research on um, how dolls used to be viewed in culture. You know, and, and the way I think about it is dolls are a mirror of mankind. Okay, it doesn't matter what area you look at, the dolls and the toys reflect what's happening at that moment in time. And it's really fun to trace that. Well, getting on Willard Library's website, um, where you go through the old newspapers, you know, I put in like doll exhibits just for fun, just to see what was happening in the world as far as dolls. Well, come to find out there were charity fairs, huge charity fairs where they raised money for different charities by exhibiting dolls. In larger communities like Chicago, you would find $10,000. How cool would that be? <laughs> yeah, go back in our little time machine, pick a few of those up, bid on them, yeah, and bring them to the prison. Would be real. And at that point in time, which would be around Civil War era, you know, because of, you know they were the women were dressing the dolls, they were selling them to raise money to help the soldiers who had been wounded, you know, to, and to take care of the people they had to take care of. At that time period, China has like these. You know, were ones that that you would have seen there. Ten thousand just mind boggles me. So then I got thinking, okay, what happened in Battle Creek? No great big charity fairs like that. Unfortunately, we were too far away from the main focus of you know the Civil War. But a lot of cool stuff happened, and that's what I wanted to share with you. I'm going to throw other stuff in along the way. I know I have a lot of doll collectors here because a lot of you I recognize. Does anybody, I don't want to say, does anybody don't know anything about dolls? <laughs> so, well, okay, so you're going to learn a little bit today, too. You'll know, we'll learn a little bit. Um, so anyway, that's why it's called charity fairs. And a lot of those were called really charity fairs. And you will find along the way, I find this really amusing, they did dolls and they did pets. Why they put the two of those together, I'm not absolutely sure. Now, my thing is trying to figure out how to make this room work so I can show you dolls that may be examples of the time periods that I'm going to show you press releases of. Okay, so, so we may have a little juggling to do. And before I even start that, um, press photos. Press photos are no more. The cameras now, like Kurt's camera, which is what they, you know, what the photographers of Jane Wire use, you cameras like that. Everything stored on a little, little disc. There was no print copies of anything anymore. When the Inquirer dumped their files, you know, the Historical Society, I believe, got, you know, got a lot of those. But I go on eBay. You can pick up. Oops, oops that's all right. You can pick up press photos from all over the world, actually. So, of course, I look for doll press photos. And I have these ranged by years. But my gosh, they are fun. So if you happen to run into any old press photos, particularly if they're dolls, or whatever you collect, because you may collect things other than dolls, these are wonderful. Hopefully, they still have the pasted paper on the back that is a little byline for the photographer or for the, you know, the newspaper that's using it that gives you some information on it. Sometimes there is not, and often these are dated, you know, and there is a, you know, a release form on there. But um, I've got tons of these, and they are absolutely wonderful. 
these are little snapshots of time and where these dolls fit in the history of the world. And that's what we need to remember. Is, and not just with dolls, but with toys and with all kinds of other collectibles. These have a place in our history, and that's what makes, and they have a history to tell us. And this just helps that. Um, also, old press releases. And this is where I went to the, you can go to the Willard Library site, and you can, you can search newspapers, you know, and it has, it's missing, there's a section of time that right now it's missing, and they still haven't put that back on yet. So between like 75 and goes up a little farther, um, the, what I had copied of before isn't going to show up. So you can go in and you can look at all the press releases, put in whatever topic you want. Um, of course, for me, it was dolls. It'll show you that, and you can enlarge it, you can crop it, and you can print it. And these are valuable. To me, they're very valuable. Again, they're, they're, they give you the context of where that item, that toy, that doll comes from. And that's what, that's what we need to keep in mind, is that, again, like I said, these are mirrors of mankind. And they show, tell, show and tell us stories about what we're doing at a particular point in time. So I'll get off my soapbox. That goes. For the moment, anyway. Now, I guess we need to start this, don't we? Let me see what's... Let's see if I can get this to do what I want it to do. Okay. I talked about the, the exhibit in Chicago. Here is one of them that was in Chicago in 1894. Um, at the Battery D Armory, this is where there were ten thousand dolls, and they were all for sale. Oh, oh my God! Mind-boggling, mind-boggling. And also, prominent actors and actresses donated dolls for this event, which would make them even more special. I can find no photographs from that time. I mean, no, no drawings. It wouldn't really have been. There would have been photography. They probably didn't take any other doll event. You know, heaven forbid, why would you think we could take one of a doll event? But um, not even any drawings. Because sometimes with, with events like that, you would find somebody would go around and do drawings of whatever was happening at that activity, and there's nothing for that. Now, the Bound Creek Daily Moon Journal. Elegant display of dress dolls for Christmas at Centennial Hall. And Chris Kurt's going, where's Centennial? I don't know. I don't know. Well... It was to benefit St. Thomas Church. And a lot of the charities that happened here in Battle Creek benefited churches in particular. Four dozen dress jobs to be sold on Wednesday evening. And this was 1885, most likely the China heads, like I showed you. Now, they're all porcelain. For those of you that know nothing about dolls, um, there are two types of porcelain dolls that you normally come in contact with. The China heads, and the reason they're called China heads is not because they were made in China, but because the finish on them looks like your China dishes. It's got a shiny glazed finish. So the ones with the white complexions, the really white complexions that look like your China head, your, your China at home, those are China heads. And also the blonde, they did fewer blondes than they did with the dark hairs, but you do find both. Then these are also porcelain. Same type of porcelain, but the finish is different. These are called bisque heads, and that's shortened from biscuit wear because the way they were fired in the kiln, they looked like biscuits that were produced at that time period. And these, actually all of them I didn't bring, I was going to bring one and I didn't. Um, these are later versions. These have a socket, a socket on their neck and they fit onto a composition body. Earlier ones have a shoulder plate. On those china heads, the head and the shoulder down to about here is all molded in one piece and then they're sewn onto a, a kid or a cloth body. And um, the earlier bisque heads are, are as well. So anyway, okay, so the four dozen dolls were going to be for sale. Now, if anybody knows any of these people, <laughs> probably not, from 1886, the Grand Army Fair which is interesting, um, was held Saturday night and it has all the people they did, um, you know, they sold dolls, they sold, they had, had cane stands, they did all kinds of interesting things. But the four dolls that were drawn, those were the winners of the dolls. So if anybody knows those families, <laughs> who knows? Um, yeah, that was, and again, China has most likely 1886, 
the majority would have been the China head downs, most likely. 1887, the ladies were arranging a down fair held in the powers of the con parlors of the Congregational Church. Down to all sizes, descriptions, and prices on sale at low prices. Attend the down fair. Yes, we need to go. We really need to go. Now, this one was kind of interesting. There was a carnival uh, at the store on 38 East Main Street. Kurt? <laughs> Come on, Kurt. Yeah. Um, a Mr. Nelson. I believe there was a store on Main Street. And I think it was a toy, just a toy store. Um, they put the dolls on exhibit just to show. So I think part, part of the reason why they did that, and you're going to see some other things like that, they did displays of toys, and it got people into their store to buy stuff. It wasn't necessarily that those dolls were for sale, but it was the merchants trying to drum up business, particularly at this time of year, because it was getting November 14th, it was getting close to, to Christmas. And it was something to do. No TV, no internet. <coughs> What did you do? Well, hopefully you went out and you met with the people and you did things. Just like on Friday night, you went downtown and you walked the streets and you saw your neighbors and you did stuff. You didn't stay home in front of your TV cell. At least I, my family didn't. Um, there was a doll carnival on Jefferson Street for St. Thomas Church. Paper dolls were on exhibit. I didn't bring any paper doll examples, though I put one in the slide. And there were two, two really different articles of kind of the same event, so I just threw them together. And they did some silverware, watches, jewelry. You know, there were other collectible, what we call collectible things now, which weren't necessarily collectible then. But um, they did have a Dow Carnival. Some of the writing was really difficult. The Independent Congregational Church. Is that different than the First Congregational? The Congregational and the, I the Presbyterians were together for a while, then they broke off and became the Independent Congregational. Okay, gotcha. Uh, gotcha. I didn't bother to, well, I figured you'd be here and I'd just yeah. ask you a question. <coughs> yes. Now, a lot of times in, in some of the ads that I've seen, and not necessarily the Battle Creek ones, but all over, they would have one really large doll on exhibit. Large doll probably would be one about this size or bigger, because these are harder to come by, and I think got broken easier, just because they were large and they're hard for little kids to handle, and they would be hard to play with anyway. She's on a composition. This question? Yes. Um, you said they had a, a toy store. Did, did most of these, were they have been bought in toy stores, or were, did like general stores have toy displays also? General stores probably didn't have okay. and, and a lot of general stores, if they had a China head doll, they didn't have the whole doll. Oh. They'd have the head. Um, like probably those two China heads, you went and you bought the head. You know, just a plain old head. You took it home, and either mom made the body out of cloth. If you had enough money, you could afford China arms and legs. If not, you just make cloth ones. And in some cases, you can tell little girls probably did them, or mama didn't know much about anatomy because they look really weird. <laughs> they're, they're not nicely done. If you had enough money, you could afford one, you know, on a commercial-made body with, you know, China arms and legs. But um, oftentimes you see them on what certainly are handmade type. Yeah, so, okay, so they had... Yeah, the large doll at the fair was in the parlor, and that's what you did chances on, and that Joanna Decker one, one. Similar to it, and I would assume it would be this size or larger, most likely. She's made in Germany, um, has sleep eyes, human hair wig, a socket body, and she's on a composition ball jointed body, which would not be easy for a little kid to play with, but these became more popular than the china heads, because they had a more realistic look. They had a flesh color look to them. They weren't the, you know, the white china head, just dark white anymore. And um, oftentimes after um, wars, you find changes in new, new materials have been invented during wartime, particularly during World War II that happened to our toy industry. 
considerably. One was because a lot of the toy centers in Germany were destroyed, but also um, they fabricated new materials to be used for the war efforts, and those were then turned and used for toys afterwards. Kurt. I had a question. The Chinese dolls looked like they were adult um, people, the dolls were, mm -hmm. but the other ones looked like they're children. Mm -hmm. Did they make China had children ones? No. There, there are a few, but they are very rare. Okay. But you, now we have to think about the context of kids during that time period. During the Civil War and before, children were not allowed to be children. They dressed as adults. They were expected to act like adults. There were no baby dolls for them to play with, and you didn't act as a baby. So, but you do find some China has dressed in more clothes that look like babies. Then around um, 1900, it was about 1900, then they started, well then they started making these. It looked more like little girls. Then they got into making baby babies <coughs> around 1900. And he's probably about 1911, I, I assume, um, a real baby. And that's when it started to be okay for moms to actually nurture and play with and care and care for their babies. So then these are called more character types because it was unusual. Normally you see the dolly face and these are referred to by collectors as dolly face because they have a real, just kind of a general, you know, these two look very similar, kind of a steery eyed look. But anything other than a steery eyed look, a smile, a frown, a cry, they're unusual to find, but they're also considered characters. They put him on a different type body. He has no clothes, sorry again, but I wanted to show you what his body looked like. Because he has a five-piece body. She has a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. She has a thirteen-piece body because of all the joints that are in, inside, all strung with elastic. He's strung with elastic too, but he only has he has a toddler body. One piece arms one piece legs and his torso, so there's only five pieces to his body. And which makes it, I think, a little bit also easier for kids to play with. You know, so, and he looked like a kid. Okay. Am I getting, am I getting too crazy here? Okay. Okay, the Moon Journal in 1901. A beautiful French doll that is attracting most, much attention is on exhibition in Hoffmaster's window. Is Hoffmaster's a department? Yes, or? it's still downtown. It would be 17 West. Oh, be okay, gotcha. Uh, yep. gotcha. And it tells who the doll was dressed for. Who and uh, Mrs. Daniels came from New York, but now she's residing with her brother on the field in Tyson Street. So she dressed the doll. Um, the doll picture is, is a French doll. This is a French doll. Pro this is a Jamal. That one's a Jamal. I don't know what the one in the picture is, but most likely it is probably a Jamal because those are very plentiful. Also, disc socket head, composition body, um, paperweight glass eyes. They were more expensive, obviously. Um, French manufacturers were more expensive in, in general. Similar, similar face. French dolls tend to have really big eyebrows, really big eyebrows. This one has a closed mouth. Closed mouth, antique German discs tend to be more expensive than open mouth, even though it took more to make an open mouth doll. I have, there's no reasoning for that other than they just want to do that, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, so we won't go any farther with that because I have no answers. It's just the way the doll market works. Maybe there were fewer of them. Maybe fewer of the closed mouth, and that makes them more, guess, the maybe. scarcity of it. Maybe I don't know. Could could be could be yeah yeah because they did you know they did come they produced tons of these dolls. I threw in a couple ads. People's outfitting on Main Street, and it was seventy nine eighty one eighty one West on Main Street. But I just want to. There is a German disc in an original outfit, so that one came that way from the manufacturer. That was not costumed by someone, and that's the way a lot of the dresses looked. If you could afford to buy one dressed, you could also go to the store and buy one in underwear, or you could buy one with nothing on. And so there were various prices depending on how much you could afford to spend. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. 
<coughs> Actual worth was a dollar, though. You were getting it for 39 cents, yes, indeed. And the brass bed, too. Heck. Value it at $1.50 for 49 cents. Now, ladies of the Independent Congregational Church we have again, plant a bazaar in the Dell Block of West Main. It includes a linen booth, which I like that. A linen booth and a doll booth, which I thought was, was kind of fun. She was not part of that picture. I just ran across that picture of her, and she was so darn cute. So I just threw it in there, just to fill up the space on the, on the slide. And it was a Unity Club Bazaar, so I, I think that was the name of a, um, you know, a group within that particular church. The Junior Auxiliary of St. Thomas is holding a silver tea, and they were giving award, rewards for the best dressed doll in the Junior Auxiliary display. So that was kind of fun. And then A.J. Little and Myra Clark were the judges, if anybody knows who those people were, back in 1910. They got the job of judging those wonderful dogs. Well, the Elks Fair, they had a hun they had already had already secured a hundred dollars and they were looking for more dogs to put in their booth. And it was dogs, dogs, dogs. Oh yeah, it says it's figured that there will be a great demand for the Near babies, which I didn't quite understand that, while well, the supply is noticeably low. And this was in 1911, though, so we're going from, you know, China heads are obsolete, bees are still okay, but now we've added these wonderful China babies, or biscuit babies, that, and that's probably why they wanted more of the babies. 1913. Okay, World War One will happen very soon. And you know during those time periods a lot of store stock that was made in Germany was put in storage and was not still sold in our in our stores. Um, so sometimes you do find some of these the world store stock that are still in really good condition because they were never sold and you know and actually played with by by um, people. But there is that 36 West Main Street. A lot was happening on Main Street. A lot was happening on Main Street. This was a bargain center on Main Street. And it did mention that $7 doll in 1913. That was a heck of a lot of money for a doll. And those would still probably be our first now, on the other flip side of the coin, I do find in particularly a lot of press, press photos, you will see different groups, women's groups, um, costuming dolls, either making them or just buying dolls by lots and dressing them and shipping them, particularly overseas or to places where there were poor people or whatever, or to orphanages or whatever to give to people. And that always brings back to me the thing about dolls being being a gift. Dolls comfort us. They really do. Um, and now I'm going to completely change the subject for the guys in the room. But then it pertains to all of us, though. Um, I was talking to a cameraman from Fox 17, and he mentioned to me, he said, you know, he said, my mom, he, he was a, he was an Iraqi vet. When he went overseas, his mom sold his Star Wars stuff. And he said, I will never forgive her for that. He said, yeah, because, yeah, some of it was expensive stuff. And he could, you know. But he said, those were my friends. They were my friends when I was little. And she sold them. And he said, and he, so he's trying to buy back the ones he had. But think about it. I mean, those of us that played with toys, whether it's dolls or action figures or, you know, stuffed animals, I don't care. They were our friends. And we don't want to forget that, that they were our friends. Dang it. These were somebody's friends. And now I'm, I, they, I, belong, I belong to them in a way. I'm stewarding them for someone who had them and loved them. And I think we just, it just, and I just felt really sorry for him because he said, I will never, ever. 
different for them. Uh, yeah, you know? Yeah, I get it. I really get it. So, anyway, um, Battle Creek churches were met at the sanitarium to talk about missionary stuff, and then they were going to be gathering dolls and toys to send to Belgium. Belgium saw a lot of relief um, during World War I in particular, and I meant to bring and I didn't. They also made dolls for the Belgian relief effort that they actually made in France. Um, yeah, and, and the, the weird thing about them is all these dolls almost look like clowns because they have really accentuated smiles. And records show in, you know, in the company that made these dolls, and it's the Unica company of France, they said they didn't want them to be sad anymore. They wanted them to be happy. So that's why they gave all the dolls a smile. Because you'll see a lot of the older German dolls, um, like Kathy Cruz and some of them, who started producing dolls after World War II. Their dolls are very serious. One, you, and I always think, well, it's because of the war. And yes, people were very serious. But her way of thinking was she wanted the child to decide whether they were happy or sad. So she gave them a serious face and let them determine that. So it's interesting how different manufacturers do that. But the, the Belgium, that Unica manufacturing company, they all have almost a chucky grin. I mean, it's just really bizarre. <laughs> I should have I I brought one. So anyway, and so they had a little girl who was an immigrant from Belgium, four years old. Um, Six weeks in America, talking, and she spoke the peaks in her native language and also in English for the, for the group that, you know, he sponsored her, apparently. So that was kind of cool. Santa's coming in 1915. Um, there, there was a display, and this is at Toyland. Is this one also on, this is on Main Street, same place. Toller Dowling Company? And I drove up down Main Street, I don't know where the heck this place is, so it was. But we found kiddling body dolls over right there. Well, they were the ones that came undressed. And the ones next to it were dressed dolls. The little ones, that, the 23 cent little, I think those were the little, two little ones. And then the 98 cent ones were larger. Those are 18 inches, I think. I can read that right. There you could get a two dollar down for a dollar eighteen. I'd like to see that happen again. Probably this type. Yeah. And how much do those dolls go for now? Approximately. I know they're all different, but approximately what would that doll sell for now? Um, I think four and six hundred probably. Okay. Uh -huh. Dow prices have gone down, just like with a lot of collectibles, stuff goes down. A while back, um, it probably would have been a thousand, but now you'd be lucky if you get a couple hundred. Yeah. In the 60s, they were about $35, because mm -hmm. I had some on layway. <laughs> In the 60s, oh yeah, that was a big deal to pay $35 for a German fifth doll. Uh, they also enticed you with paper dolls. Paper dolls were in the newspapers. And one thing, working at the art center, okay, um, we see a lot of little kids in there who do not know how to cut. They do not know how to hold scissors. Mm -hmm. Little girls don't cut out paper dolls anymore. Everything is stickers or magnets. Mm -hmm. So if you have granddaughters and even grandsons, get them something to cut out. Because I tell you, I mean, these are third and fourth graders, and they still don't, they don't even know how to hold scissors. Like, how do I hold these? They have no clue. No, no, no. So anyway, you saw lots of paper dolls. Doll contest at the Grant store. Little girls of Battle Creek, the large numbers of whom are preparing to bring their dollies to enter the contest for prizes for the best dressed doll. First price was 10 bucks. In 1923, that was a good chunk change. Mm -hmm. Second price was five dollars, and third price was three dollars. Mm -hmm. And said so the little girl did not have to dress her own doll. A lot of times, of course, they use that as sewing skills for little, little girls. But in this case, mom or grandma could dress one. Mm -hmm. 
and the owner too. So I'm sure that was probably a fight to the death to see who would end up with the coolest costume. This picture just thrilled the heck out of me. This is not in Valley Creek, but I put it anyway. This is in my little, little book that you guys are welcome to look at these once we get done. Hotel employees at the Hotel Roosevelt in New York City dressing. They probably a whole they they probably purchased a whole bunch of the undressed big German biz dolls, about her size actually from what it looks like. And um, they dressed them and they piled them all up. And they were gonna give them to the poor kids. Mm -hmm. But how cool. Again, a gift for those that don't have much. Oh, and this was just bizarre. And I'm trying to piece this together. There was a tavern in town on South Kendall Street, you know, okay. And when Prohibition ended, to decorate their tavern, they brought in 150 foreign dolls mm -hmm. and put them up around the tavern to make it look colorful. Now, how cool was that? Dang! And there was this big long article. It wasn't all about the dolls, unfortunately, and there's no pictures. But the Crosstown Tavern, wherever that is, on South Kendall Street. It sounded really fun. Christmas festival at the Maple Methodist Church cost two cents to see the dolls. Mm -hmm. It says that more adults than children came to view it. Of course. And they talk about some of the um, dolls by name. And this is when they were given dolls' names. Which I thought was a little strange. Can you explain the, the, the headline toy trunk of beds? You know, toy trundle beds yield dolls for church display. I think what they were, were getting at was that, you know, oftentimes you, you might store things in your trundle bed, you know, and it might have been dolls. I know there was a gal in Eaton Rapids that had an antique one. I used to go and, and put dolls up. That's where I put my doll, my German head dolls up way, way in the 60s. And she would pull on her trundle bed and she had dolls. But she didn't have them on display because they didn't have nice clothes on. And those were ones that I could afford because I was in junior high back then. You know, and I couldn't afford a $200 doll, but I could put on layaway a $35 one. They didn't have any clothes that I could afford. And I didn't sew either, so I had to scrounge and find clothing. But, so I think that's probably okay. Oh, that Mrs. Heeman's store? I'm sorry? Is that Mrs. Heeman's in Eaton Rapids? Sure was. Yes, there too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They had a doll derby at the Presby store. Big dolls, little dolls, fat dolls, ugly dolls, 112 <laughs> dolls of various classifications were on exhibit for the unusual doll derby sponsored by the SS Presby store. Um, and then there were prizes given out and they list to all, you know, all the people offered. And they gave prizes for like the largest doll. Probably a big doll, but they don't mention that one. They don't tell you which doll was the ugliest one. So, best, best costume for a doll. Um, one of the dolls was made in Alaska and fashioned of board, board and cotton. Another was made entirely of wood and contained five smaller dolls. Russian nested, must be. Um, one doll was over 75 years old, another <coughs> over 60. There were dolls from Russia, Germany, Japan, Hawaii, Holland, and Alsace Lorraine. Two small dolls were dressed in the style of Joe March or the old women. And it just kind of goes on and on. Several dolls were only one half inch tall. There was one puppet, a family of clothespin dolls, and one topsy turvy rag doll. Oh, Mrs. Yes. 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 She has six. <laughs> yes, there is six specimens. I thought, okay, we're calling down specimens now. That's interesting. But um, a lot of you'll find, particularly in the press photos, there are photos of young girls that have collections of, of foreign dolls. And it was, part of it was, you know, once travel picked up around 19, uh, early 1900s, it, people could afford to travel to foreign countries. 
They picked up dolls to send home to people. And then they encouraged their daughters to collect foreign dolls, one to learn about the countries. You know, and then if they went traveling, it was a nice souvenir to bring home for them. So you find that often. And you do find, yeah, like I said, you find press, press photos and um, stories about little girls who have collections of, of ethnic dolls. And she talks about a lot of the ones that she has. This is Franklin Roosevelt is selecting a doll at a one day bazaar held by the Blue Mill Industries in Washington, D.C. You do find lots of photographs of um, historical celebrities who are actually buying dolls. We're looking at dolls. This is 1938 now. 1941, Quincy Toy Manufacturing Company on Fremont Street. Um, they made, and they didn't do that many dolls. They did a lot of stuffed animals. But they did a man in the moon, especially for the Lord and Taylor store in New York, which was really kind of cool. And I would love to see, I've never seen a picture of one. I don't know if one even exists anymore. The majority of them do not exist anymore. But, um, Blanche and Bernice. So, so that, that was a manufacturing on mm -hmm. Fremont? Yep. They, they actually Made made those? Yeah. yeah. There'll only be another picture of them. They're coming back up here in a little bit. Um, oh, and then the, the Central Grill finds a war of Freeze's hobby of doll collecting. This world collects ethnic dolls. Okay, it's 1942. The war's on. There are no ethnic dolls going anywhere in the world at that point in time. Some of the other um, companies that dealt in ethnic dolls, like Kimport Dolls, which a lot of you don't know, but they, um, they produced a little tiny magazine. They sold antique dolls, and they also um, brought in dolls from other countries. Well, they had they stopped doing that, and they just had to, because at that time, we had other things on our minds besides importing dolls from other countries. So she talks about dolls she had and all the dolls that she wished she had, and, that, and then her dolls have been on display at WK. Kellogg School and at the Inner Club Council of the YWCA. She knew who that was. So whoever Mary Gibbs was in 1942, if anybody knows Mary Gibbs, might be that age. Across the street from her, but her mother was a, a, a school teacher, and her mm -hmm. father taught. Um, I think uh, I don't know if it was physics or chemistry or something. I figured there had to be something somewhere that somebody was on. Okay, January 1943, the children of the St. Phil donated dolls to furnish a doll booth and the dolls they sold to raise money for the church. And it talks about the parents being so proud of their children being able to do that and, you know, and giving up their toys to raise money to make renovations for the church. So that was really kind of cool. So it, and it goes on and on with stuff. I just picked out kind of highlights because obviously there's no way you guys can read all this anyway. But okay, here we are. Four bathroom firms were making were helping Santa in making toys in large quantities. Twenty toy company, and there's the two ladies. The largest of the local toy manufacturers, which I thought was funny because I think they're the only toy manufacturers in Battle Creek, I think. Um, yeah. We're making about a dozen items for the market. There they show. It's, it's, it's predominantly stuffed animals. <coughs> but, um, that was kind of fun. Oh, and this was, a, this was great. Okay, July 25th, 1947, there is a doll and pet show uh, at the Union Steel Playground in Albion. At a hundred entrants in the show, and reading the, the thing in the paper, and it says that two, two of the winners were Glenda Sue and Cheryl Gall. Those are my cousins. And I didn't know that. I mean, I knew they were my cousins. Well, I didn't know they wanted anything in a doll show. Their mother was a really fantastic seamstress, and I'm sure she dressed the dolls. You know, so I had to, I called her right away. I said, 
hey, did you ever win? She didn't. You know, I was like, I don't know, I guess I did. And, you know, but that was really funny. But it was interesting they combined dolls with pets, probably to, to encourage both boys and girls to attend. You know, particularly for families where, you know, if you had both, you might not be able to leave the son at home and just take the daughter, and you wanted to make it inclusive with the other guy. Kingdom Museum exhibit in 1950, they were donated a huge amount of um, ethnic dolls. They have some gorgeous ones out there, and I do them all over the cases when I go out there. And my, actually, my son Joshua works there. He found that in their archives, and so it's not a terribly great picture, but the paper wasn't very wonderful anymore either. But it did show some of their ethnic dolls, and those are, those are you know, about this tall, German disc, probably made around 1900 to about 1913, and that again is when people were starting to travel. They had money to travel, they were going to these different countries, and they were finding German, and the German doll companies would dress them in different ethnic outfits from all over, you know, all over Europe, um, the Middle East, um, there are even African ones. You know, that, that are black fists that are absolutely gorgeous and extremely mm -hmm. hard to come by. But um, Kingman's got a really nice collection. They have a few on display all the time. Display of 20 dollars dressed in costumes from 14 yeah. countries in the Cronin store window. And this was actually for AAUW to point out the fact that they supported um, foreign students studying in American universities and colleges. So they have a display there in 1952. Are you going to help us do it again? Sure will. Okay. I think we should. Yeah. Yeah. I three of us are really think we should. Heck yes. All right. We'll plan on it. All right. <laughs> and 1954. These are escapees from Czechoslovakia, and they were presenting President Eisenhower with a doll dressed in Czechoslovakian costume. Mm -hmm. That happened a lot. Dolls are used as gifts. Gee, why? Because a doll is an innocent thing. It's something we all remember from childhood. You know, it's, it, it's a commonality that we all played with something when we were little, whether it's a, a doll or, you know, I, I don't know. You, yeah, whether you want to call it a doll or not, it's a, it's a human form. And, um, yeah, it's really cool. Japanese war widows presented five hundred dollars to the Mennonite Church of the United States as tokens of gratitude for two thousand food parcels sent by the church last winter. Interesting. 1955. In Japan, the doll industry is huge, and it is an art form, much more of an art form than it is here in the United States. Um, and those dolls. I'm sure were extremely expensive, and it was an effort for them to do that. But it was a real genuine token that if they did that, that was a gift in the United States. Nineteen fifty-five, Queen Elizabeth smiles as she receives a Dutch doll from a little girl at the Ideals Home Exposition here. The doll was one of a pair given to the queen for her children, Prince Charles and Princess Anne. I'm sure they don't need those now, but hopefully they're in storage somewhere and they still have them. Another, you know, another thing that shows that they were gifts and that's what you gave. And in my, in my press photo thing, you'll, just, you'll see lots of pictures of, of um, celebrities. Oh, actually, if I know it. Amy Eisenhower. She's a Greek doll for one of the travels. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, dolls are given as gifts. I think that's the last, that's it. Now, while I'm at it though, let me, let me explain what's on the table. You are certainly welcome to look at what's on the table. There are just a few more things I wanted to talk about too while we're at it. Um, I did bring a wax example. Thank goodness the weather wasn't too cold today, because otherwise some of these would not be coming out, just because just because it's cold. Um, but the china heads, actually before the china heads, would be wax. 
she has wax over paper mache. Okay, so there's a paper mache form underneath. The wax is put on the top, and then um, and then she's painted cloth body, um, paper mache hands, paper mache feet, most likely. Yep. And then hand dress. A lot of those would have been in those in those displays that you saw because it was really like paper mache china. I'm sorry, paper mache and wax, china heads. Then we get into this. I'm not. And she has glass eyes, by the way. Little tiny cracks. If you have any of these at home, or if you have any, if you have any of these, <laughs> just put it that way. Keep them at even temperature and humidity. Do not store them in the attic. Do not store them in the basement or in, or in the garage where they're going to get cold. The, the paper mache underneath the wax expands and contracts at a different rate than the wax on top does. That's why she's formed tiny cracks on her face. If she is kept in, in a bad way like that, in, in where temperature changes or humidity changes happen frequently and happen quickly, this wax will fall off. Eventually it's just going to come right off the face. China heads, we don't have to worry about the head, but sometimes you have to worry about the body. Now most of these are on cloth bodies. She has China legs. Sorry guys, she has China legs. Um, China hands, which are reproductions. You say, oh, how can you tell her? We won't even get into all that right now. And then her breastplate goes down here. They've padded her to make her look like she is an adult lady. Usually you don't find that padding. And this head could be used for a boy or a girl because it has exposed ears. And I do see these dressed in, in men's outfits as well as women's outfits. Um, also, the hairstyle defines what time line they come from. She is probably 1880s, most likely, just because of the hairstyle. This one is more 1860, around the Civil War time. And someone did a great deal of detail on making this dress fit her so well. And I think the vast majority of these are. The one is on a handmade body, this is on a commercial body. She has a nice cup, straight, straight, but a slight cup in her hands. That means those are very old. And that, is, that dates her just about Civil War. Also, look for impurities. You know, oftentimes, well, gee, I don't want one that's got a mark on its face, but sometimes the mark on its face is a good thing. The, the little dirt piece that's on her cheek, that came from dirt that was in the mold. When, when the porcelain was poured into the mold, there was dirt in it. And so that's one indication that she's old. If you find no imperfections in them at all, and you're not sure if they're old or not, they may be a new one, because the new ones you don't collect the dirt in those molds anymore. And also she has a word of her hair. You know, because she was loved and she was played with and somebody laid her down a lot and you know, may have put her bonnet on and off, who knows. But she's seen a lot of love. And this one is also probably that same time period. Um, we talked about the Jamal. She's probably 1890s, I would imagine. Um, 1910. These two are probably around 1900 or so. Composition. Non-breakable composition. And that's what, the, what they marketed it as, is you can't break them. So this is composition. Their bodies are composition. Now, after the war effort, we have composition that's used for the entire doll. And it worked out very well, except in extreme temperatures again and humidity. This stuff will crackle and craze and fall apart, and you cannot repair it and have it. Anyway, you, you can do things to it, but most collectors don't. And some collectors will not even, even buy dolls in composition because you don't know what's going to happen to them. And they can sit on the shelf in even temperature and humidity for years, and all of a sudden you look at them, and they've got cracks on their faces. And it's just it's a wood pulp mixed with glue that's underneath. Then it's um, painted with oil paint, a real thick oil paint. And again, with the changes in temperature and humidity, the stuff expands and contracts at different rates, and that's what makes it change. She was hand-dressed. She was, she's a, I don't even know that she's anybody in particular. A lot of the, the companies that made these composition dolls during the 1930s and 1940s 
did not put their names on them, so we don't know who they are. She and was kind of a Shirley Temple. Of yeah, a Shirley and Temple and a Patsy. Because yeah, it was during that, right. that same time. Yeah. 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 And the little bit arm and stuff. But um, a lot of times, you know, people would buy them again for these charity things and they would hand dress them. And this is a hand dressed outfit made to look like an Elizabeth most likely. Or Princess Elizabeth, because she wouldn't have been king yet. But um, mohair wigs, she's got sleek tin eyes. You find a lot of tin eyes. They slowly changed to plastic eyes. A lot of times the plastic eyes were all crackled and they just looked really bizarre. But the, the tin eyes survived a little bit better. Then I, I tried to stick with stuff before, like up to 1950. So I did not really did not bring any plastic plastic. This is hard plastic. And the reason I bought her is this was a different kind of char charity bazaar. Not well, not really. It's still a charity bazaar. But for um, I find a lot of the dolls like this, um, which you could buy for maybe a dollar, you know, in a store with just underwear on, um, in either dressed in Polish outfits or in Czechoslovakian outfits. And a lot of them were done for churches, so they could raise money either to send back to their families there, or maybe to support bringing families to the United States. And I find a lot of them, and there are a lot of them, a lot of pictures of the ladies at the bazaars. And these are hand-done outfits. They're absolutely gorgeous. I find it unusual that it's usually Polish or Czechoslovakian and not German and, you know, some of the other countries that you would expect to see a lot from. But, um, you know, and, and obviously they were very proud of their national costume in order to create these outfits like that. So, and she was, and she was hard plastic. Hard plastic came after composition. And this, and hard plastic came out of World War II. So that's why, and then, of course, and then hard plastic evolved into plastic and vinyl and all the stuff we have now. And she has plastic eyes and sleep eyes and she's doing it and has rubber bands on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question. Kurt. So I'm sure dolls existed all through history, but that they weren't popular until the late 1800s. I mean, because people must did. I mean, you always assume you see rag dolls and stuff in movies of old. Um, yeah, real, and most, most rag dolls were put into trash cans and burned. Yeah, but I mean, they, they had dolls back when people had dolls. Oh, yeah, the Greeks and Romans made dolls. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Well, in all, in all cultures, yeah. they That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. okay. See, that's the one commonality I think that we all have. Is, yeah, we've all played with dolls in some way, shape, or form. You know, whether it's a stick. In some cases, in some cultures, yeah, it's a stick that you just wrap something around and that's the clothing for it. Well, that's fine. The Americans do feel the same thing. But we all have those, you know, when you're little, you want to pretend you're grown up, I guess. Or you want to have a friend. And if you don't have a friend, you make a friend. You know, that's, you make your own little family. And your country people are so far apart. The families, they live so far apart. Dollar use for different things. Some dolls, you know, or, or you know, they're fertility symbols, which are not necessarily dolls. They're completely different. You know, in the was in the was in seventy. No, 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 no. It was in eighty. God, dang it, I can't remember. In the late 80s, I got a call from the Attorney General. I'd written some articles for Dow Reader magazine on Russian states. Yeah, on Russian nesting. <laughs> on Russian nesting dolls. Well, at that time, when they were importing them into the United States, they were charging a tariff on them as wooden objects. But since I had written these articles, <laughs> darn me, um, yeah, um, you know, saying that these these nesting dolls were dolls, the U.S. government wanted to increase the tariff, and there was a higher tariff on dolls than there was on wooden <laughs> objects. Mm -hmm. So, 
they flew me to Los Angeles. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that the judge must have thought we were absolutely out of our minds. <laughs> they flew me out there for a trial. So, you know, okay, sure enough. And was two days, two days. They paid my aircraft, they paid my gentleman just for this thing. And then the attorneys, well, I'm really getting off subject here, but this is just so bizarre. The attorneys went out and bought um, ethnic dolls. They bought um, African fertility figures, a gorgeous one. This, they spent our tax dollars on some really nice dolls. <laughs> they did, you know, and they bought a Russian nested that was probably oh, like oh, this. I probably had a hundred. I might not. dare to imagine they didn't unnest the blasted thing, but they had you know that there, and they had a couple other ones, you know, and it just blew my mind. It took a birthday Russian one, you know. Oh. And so I asked the, the you know the attorney with the man. I said, what happens to these? So they go into storage. And so I'm immediately thinking, you know, Indiana Jones, you know, <laughs> when they're putting them in the crates and they're and so somewhere. In storage is probably these really gorgeous dolls that should be in somebody's collection. Sitting on the shelf, so yeah. in the box. <laughs> yeah, really. So, you know, so we talked about you know dolls not having to have arms and legs. I mean, it can still be a doll even though it doesn't have arms and legs. It's whatever. You know. So the trial ended. She was going to call me and tell me what happened. She never did. <laughs> so I don't know. And I, said, I guess a certain time period has to go by before then you can check and see what's what. And if I, and I'm sure I still have the paperwork somewhere. If I get the case file, I could probably have them. You know, but but that was just so bizarre. But they were, you know. I think I read about you in the Mueller report. You were the <laughs> 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 Yeah, really weird, really weird. The Russian connection you were in. <laughs> that was it. That was it. You were absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Is there one on your necklace? Oh, yeah. oh like this, this is metal. Okay. It's a, it, she's a little. She's supposed. She looks like a little um, peg wooden doll that they made in England. The the gal that made this one, her dad made the big peg wooden ones really out of, out of wood, and this one she made out of metal. And I got her at one of the doll conferences that I went to. But yeah, I hear her out. She's not too.